Hey everyone, it's Mark and I'm back with another flight sim tutorial on the PMDG 737 and this time we're going to be looking at everything that you need to know to prepare the flight deck for a full flight. This video is part of a three episode deep dive on the 737 and in the subsequent parts we're going to be looking at how to fly the route that we're about to program into the FMC. I'm starting out at LaGuardia's gate 59 and before we do anything I'm going to quickly show you how I set up this flight in SimBrief but because many of you are going to be coming from Xbox watching this tutorial I'm not going to use the built-in SimBrief integration and we'll input everything it tells us manually. There isn't all that much that needs to be done. I've set my origin to KLGA for LaGuardia, my destination to KBOSS for Boston, and in the aircraft type, I picked the 737-800 for the airframe, and right next to it in that other dropdown, I picked the PMDG economy config. It automatically picked runway 22 for departure and 27 for the arrival, but depending on the winds when you're trying this, it might give you different runways, so you might have to pick them manually from the dropdowns. And the last thing that you have to change on here is the fuel units, which by default I set to kilograms, but you're going to want to set it to pounds because that's what the 737 uses by default. For the route, I've actually built this one myself, so it covers a bunch of edge cases that you might run into when you're flying this airplane anywhere around the world. And I'm going to put it in the description of the video in case you want to copy it to reproduce this flight. I'm going to get into more details about the route and what everything means once we're programming it into the FMC. So for now, I'm just going to press the generate button so it creates the load sheet and the full OFP so that we can use it in the cockpit. Let's bring the cockpit to life now. And the first thing I'm going to do is go to the overhead panel and turn the battery on by just closing the guard. And then I'll head back down to the FMC. The first thing that you need to check out is the panel state that you're currently in, which is basically PMDG's way to quickly change the state of the airplane with just a couple of button presses. Once you go into the PMDG menu, you can see what the default start state is. We're looking for it to be set to cold and dark GPU. So if that's not what you're seeing, you want to click load state. Scroll through it with the next page button until you get the cold and dark GPU and then you'll just select it and then press execute to reset it. I won't do it here because I'm already in the cold and dark GPU state and it would actually reset the battery and cause me to start over. But if you aren't, you're definitely going to want to do that and just go back and turn your battery back on. While we're here, there's another setting that you should check out before you get started, and that's what the IRS alignment is set to, which is basically what the airplane uses to determine its location precisely around the world. You can get to that by going into Options, Simulation, and then clicking IRS Options, and I recommend setting it to fast if it isn't there already, just to make things happen a little bit quicker, because normally it would take about 7 minutes to align itself. Next, we can head back to the overhead panel and turn the IRS knobs to the nav position to start the alignment process. And if you want to see how long it takes to actually do the alignment, you can turn the display selector to heading status. So like that, we're going to see how long the alignment takes on the panel that's right there. While we're here, let's turn the ground power to on just by flicking the switch down. And then let's close the emergency exit light guard as well while we're at it. Now let's head back down to the FMC and you can see there are some messages that came up in the time that we were configuring stuff on the overhead. All I'm going to do for now is press the clear button to remove them and we'll fix all of them up a little bit later. I'll head back to the top level menu and this time I'm going to go into FS actions and then go into the payload screen and you can see that by default the plane is starting out fully loaded. You can set the plane to empty from here and then use the ground services menus to load all the passengers and the cargo progressively. But for this video, I'm just going to leave it as is and I'll probably cover all of those details in a subsequent video. Instead, we'll go back to the previous screen and then go into the fuel option that's right at the top. And this is where we're going to need our Simbri flight plan for the first time. On the load sheet, we can see it's telling us that the block fuel for this flight is 13,395 pounds. And that's how much fuel we're going to need from pushback all the way to shutdown on the other end, including any contingencies for a diversion. So I'm going to punch that into the scratch pad and then load it into the fuel box that's right at the top. 
We're ready to put everything into the FMC now, but before we get to that, I want to remind you to please hit the like button if you haven't already and think about subscribing as well. It's going to do me a really big favor and it's also going to help other simmers out to find these tutorials too. All right, let's give the plane all the information that it needs for our flight. So I'm going to hit the menu button again, and this time I'm going to head into the FMC. It starts off on the IDEN page and there isn't anything that needs to be done here, but you can see that at the bottom it's saying that my nav data is out of date. I'm just going to clear that message since this is really only important if you want to fly on VATSIM with the airplane if you're on PC. And otherwise it isn't really a big deal, it just means some procedures might be out of date, but for our flight plan there shouldn't be any big changes. Let's keep walking through the FMC flow and the next page it wants us to go to is the pause in it page. So I'll just click on that. And what we need to do here is tell the airplane what its current position is. When we turn the IRSs to the nav position on the overheads, the onboard GPS has picked up their current location of wherever you are around the world. And to get those values, all you've got to do is press the next page button and you're going to see the GPS left and GPS right are just shown right there with their coordinates. You can click on either one of those and it's going to load it into the scratch pad, at which point you can go back to the previous page that we were on and you can load that value into the set IRS position right there. At that point, if you were looking at the instruments, you probably saw a couple of things change and that's just because the airplane is configuring itself with its current location and we're pretty much all set on this page. The next page in the setup flow is to go through to the route page and there's a fair bit of explanations we need to cover here. I want to point out before we get going on all of the route details, I'm going to be showing you the route from the SimBrief planning screen rather than the one that you see after you hit the generate button. At its core, the route is the same, but there are a couple of extra details on the one that you get after you press the generate button. For example, you're going to have the speed and the altitudes at certain waypoints, and you'll have the direct entries as well, which you don't necessarily need to program into the FMC, which is why I decided to just simplify it for the video. On either end of the route, we've got our origin and our destination airports, and you can see that both of them are followed by a slash and a number, which is there just to tell you what runway that we're going to be using for takeoff and landing. That's the first bits of information that we need to enter on this screen. So I'm going to enter origin as KLGA for LaGuardia, and then I'll do the exact same thing with the destination. I'm going to set it to KBOS for Boston. And for the origin, you can see that I can also input the departure runway. So I'm going to plug in 22 into that one as well. The next part of the route after the departure airport is a SID or a standard instrument departure. And that's going to be composed of one or many waypoints. And they're usually going to be easy to pick out because most of the time they're going to be a waypoint name followed by a number. In this case, you can see that we're going to be flying the Jutes 3 departure. The best way to load that in is to go to the departure arrival page, then go into the departure airport, which is KLGA in our case. And if I select my departure runway first, it's going to filter down the list to only the procedures that are valid for that runway. In our case, like we saw, it's the Juice 3, so I'll pick that one. And after that, under the transition, you can see it says none. But for a lot of departure procedures, you're going to have a few options to pick from here. What you'd want to do in that case is to look at what the next waypoint is after the departure procedure and see if there is a transition that matches it with the exact same name. For example, if there was a BDR transition listed for the Juice Turi departure, I'd pick that one because it's the next waypoint in my flight plan. But on the other hand, if none of the listed transition matched the next waypoint, then I wouldn't pick a transition at all. Let's go back to the route page now. And if I click on next page from here, you can see it's taking me to where I can enter in all of the waypoints of my route. This screen is split in two columns. On the left is where you'd have any procedures or airways that are in your flight plan. For example, you can see we've got our Jutes 3 departure there. And on the right is where you're going to have all of the waypoints that are part of your route. For this flight, we're starting from the Juice 3 departure, which is already preloaded because that's what we just selected. And that's got a couple of waypoints within it. From there, we go to the Bridgeport waypoint. So I'm going to type BDR into the scratch pad and I'll load it in on the following line on the right hand side since it's a waypoint. OK, it's prompting me to choose which BDR waypoint that we actually want to use because there's more than one in the database. And most of the time, it's always going to be the first one because it's showing them in order of distance from closest to furthest. 
but you should still read what it says and make sure that the name matches what you're expecting and that the coordinates make sense. The next entry in our route is MAD, which is another waypoint, so I'll enter it exactly like the previous one on the right hand side of the screen. And you can see that again, it's asking me to confirm which MAD waypoint that I want. And just like last time, it's the first one because it's the closest and the name and the coordinates make sense with the Madison VOR, which is between New York City and Boston. The next entry in the route is V475, which is an airway, and they always start with a letter followed by a sequence of numbers pretty much everywhere around the world, so they're always easy to pick out from your flight plan, and those need to be put in on the left-hand side of the screen. And then I can put in the ORW waypoint, which is the next waypoint in the route on the right hand side, because we're going to be flying on V475, and then we're going to be going to the ORW waypoint. The last part of the route is the wounds to arrival. So for that, I'm going to go back to the departure arrival page. And this time I'm going to go into the arrival for Boston. And I'm going to pick my approach first again, just so it filters down the list of stars. In this case, I'm going to be landing on runway 27. So you can see it shows me only the stars that are valid for 27. And the wounds to arrival is just on the next page. There's no transition point for the star, so I don't need to pick anything here. But just like with the SID, if there were options listed, I would pick the one that matches the previous waypoint from the route. So for example, if there was an ORW transition, I'd end up picking that one here. For runway 27, there's only one choice for the initial approach fix. That's the AB waypoint, so I'm going to pick that one as well. But if there was more than one, you could decide which one you wanted to use by just looking at the actual chart and seeing which one made the most sense for your direction of flight. All right, so let's go back to the route page. And from here, if I press the activate button now and then execute that, it's going to set my flight plan as my active flight plan. And we can see that at the top, it now says active route. Now I can go to the legs page to fix up any issues with the route and to make it a little bit easier for me, I'm going to switch myself into plan mode and I'm going to increase the range to 40 nautical miles so that we can easily see a little bit more of our route on the navigation display. At the bottom of the FMC, you can see there's a step button right there. And if I press it, it literally takes me through all of the waypoints that we programmed in for the route. And for the first few waypoints, you can see that everything seems all right. We've got nice straight lines from our departure airport all the way up to the Bridgeport waypoint. Just before the Bridgeport waypoint though, you can see there's a gap in the route because what would happen in the real world is ATC would typically give you vectors from the end of your departure procedure to the beginning of the en route part of your flight. But to make things easier for yourself when you're flying the airplane offline, the easiest thing to do to get rid of this vector from the end of your departure procedure is to just click on the border waypoint, which is the next waypoint in the route, and plug it on top of the vector's waypoint. That's showing me a preview of the change that it's going to make on the map, as well as in terms of the waypoints. Our route is now going to go straight from the tennis waypoint to the Bridgeport waypoint, which is exactly what I want. So I'll press execute to load that in. Let's keep stepping through the flight plan and it looks pretty good until I run into the route discontinuity between wounds and AB. My first instinct with this discontinuity was to remove it, but if you look at where it is, it's between the last waypoint of the arrival at Wounds and the first waypoint of the approach, which is the initial approach fix at AB. So in this case, you're actually better off to leave it in. If you were to get rid of this continuity, you would end up with a bypass waypoint in the FMC, which basically means that the airplane can't make the turn that you're asking it to do. So it's going to skip that waypoint, but that means that the approach is going to be a lot shorter and you won't be able to fly it properly. Instead, by leaving it in, when we get to the end of the star, we're going to have a couple of different choices on how to get to the initial approach fix. And we'll look at that once we're in the landing video. Next up, we're going to go to the Perfinite page, which you can access by pressing init ref. And the first thing I'm going to set here is the cost index. That's the number that's used by the airplane to know how fast it can fly and how much fuel it's actually going to burn. And you can use the values that's shown in the Simbri flight plan if you want. But I usually use 65 regardless of what it says, because it's going to give me a decent airspeed for climb, cruise and descent. 
The fuel reserves number comes from the Simbri flight plan and we're looking for the FinRes plus alternate number in the fuel section. And for this flight, it's just a touch under 7,400. So I'm gonna plug 7.4 into the box. I always tend to round this number up. The zero fuel weight entry gets automatically calculated for you by the airplane. And all you've got to do to load it in is press the button once so it goes into the scratch pad and press it a second time to load it into the field. And you're going to notice that once you do that, it's also calculated your gross weight right at the top as well. Next, I'm going to set the cruise altitude, which according to the flight plan should be 21,000 feet. So I just need to plug that into the scratch pad and put it in at the top right. And the last bit of information that I need is the cruise winds, which you can find near the top of the flight plan under the average wind field. In this case, it's saying 271 at 62 knots. So I'll enter 271 slash 62 and just plug that in as well. There's a bit more performance stuff that we need to fill out if we go into the N1 limit menu. And by default, it's picked the full thrust takeoff, so it does not derate the engine. And I leave this as is, since we don't have a proper calculator for it yet integrated into the sim. That should come when they release the EFB for this airplane, but until then, I haven't really been touching it. There are some third-party apps out there that can do the D-rate calculation for you if you really want, but they're all paid products at the moment, and I personally don't really find it worth it for the level of skill that I have with this airplane, but you might feel differently, and I'll include some links to them in the notes below. Let's go to the takeoff page next, and we're going to use a flap setting of 5, and that's pretty much what you're going to use for all takeoffs in the 737. So again, it's really just a matter of plugging that in right at the top left. Next, we can load in the center of gravity by clicking on the key that's right next to it, and that's going to load it into the scratch pad. And if we click it a second time, it's going to load it into the actual field. At that point, it's telling us that we have to set the trim to 4.75. So I'm going to go down to the trim wheel now, and I'm looking to turn it until it's just a touch below the 5. It's going to be really hard to get it very precisely. I find you just have to get this approximately right anyways. The last thing to set up on this page is the V-speeds. And again, all we've got to do is click next to each entry because it's already pre-calculated them for us. And it's going to load them in and set little marks on the airspeed indicator that we're going to see once we're doing our takeoff. The V2 speed, which is the minimum safe climbing speed with a single engine, needs to also be set on the MCP panel, which is basically the autopilot panel. So I'm going to go there now, and it's really just a matter of rotating the IIS knob to set it to the correct airspeed. The last thing that I like to do is just go back to the FMC, go to the climb and cruise pages to make sure that there's nothing that's pending there that needs to be activated. On a couple of times this has happened to me and it's caused the autopilot not to engage later on. So it's always a good idea to just double check it. At this point, we can do a few final checks on the MCP. And the first thing I'm gonna make sure is turn the auto throttle to on. And next, I'll arm the flight directors first on the captain's side and then on the first officer's side. And I'll quickly set the altimeter to the right value by just pressing the B key, although you could set it manually with the barrel knob that's just to the left if you prefer. The next thing to do is to set the cruise altitude to 21,000 feet so it matches what we entered into the FMC. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to set my heading to match the runway heading in case I need to really quickly hand off to the autopilot. It'll at least keep flying the runway heading automatically for me. The other thing that I like to do is just arm LNAV and VNAV for a second to make sure that they both arm correctly because it's going to be a pretty good indication that everything is set up properly in the FMC. But I'm going to disable VNAV for now and leave the LNAV on and I'll explain why I do that just a little bit closer to takeoff. The last thing I'm going to do is go to the overhead and now that the IRS is aligned, I can turn the yaw damper to on. And I'm also going to set my flight altitude on the right hand side so that the plane pressurizes properly as we climb. With all of that done, I am ready for pushback, but unfortunately that's going to be in part two of this deep dive, so I hope you stick around for that. And if you got some value, please make sure to hit the like button on your way out, and don't forget to subscribe as well so that you get the next video in this series.